Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nishan Sharma, and I welcome you all to the first thematic session of the 15th All India Conference of China Studies, organized by the Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi, and the Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati, in cooperation with Guwahati University and Omiyo Kumar Das Institute of Social Change and Development, in partnership with the India Office, Conrad Adenor Stiftung. The theme of this panel is titled Northeast India and Trans Himalayan Connections, Culture and Trade. And we are glad to have with us Professor Patricia Uberoy as the chair. Professor Uberoy is an Emeritus Fellow and former chairperson of the Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi. We are also delighted to have Professor Samir Kumar Das as the discussant for this session. Dr. Das is a professor of political science at the University of Calcutta and a former Vice Chancellor of University of North Bengal, Siliguri. Our first speaker for this session is Mayungan Muinao, Doctoral Candidate, Department of Political Science, Northeastern Hill University, Shillong. He will be discussing his paper, Reinventing the Northeast India Trans-Himalayan Trading Route in the Height of Indo-China Relations, Challenges and Prospects. Our second speaker is Matthew Thongmin Lal, Doctoral Candidate, Center for East Asian Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Matthew will be speaking on cultural and trade route linkages between India, Myanmar and China, a study of frontier tribe Jingpo Kachin Singfo. Our final speaker is Jigme Yeshe Lama, Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science, University of Calcutta. Dr. Lama will be speaking on disconnections, residues and Tibetan Buddhism in the Eastern Himalayas. You can find their detailed bios in the brochure provided in the chat box. Now, before I invite Professor Uberoy to begin the proceedings, let me lay out a few housekeeping rules. All the speakers are requested to stick to their time limits of around 15 to 18 minutes. All participants, except the speakers, will be muted for the duration of the event. Participants are requested to send in their queries via the chat box or use the raise hand option Please unmute yourself only when called upon by the chair to do so. I will now invite the chair to begin the proceedings. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much, Nishant. And you've uh, already introduced the theme and the speakers. So thank you for uh, taking, the, uh, taking on that uh, task. Um, now, this is the uh, first of the several uh, three, three or four thematic panels, and as you said, entitled Northeast India and Trans-Himalayan Connections, both culture and trade. Uh, we have to see this in the uh, light of the uh, structure of the uh, AICCS uh, conferences, um, where we have a thematic, we have thematic panels on a special theme, in this case, connected geographies and cultural interfaces, wonderful topic. Yeah? And um, uh, the, uh, these themes often have a connection of some sort uh, um, with the institutions and the academic partners, uh, wherever they might be. In this case, it's um, utterly appropriate that our uh, partners should be from the Northeast, from Assam, the uh, IIT, the university, and the Omeyakuma Das Institute. So welcome to you all, and thank you for uh, participating in this uh, particular thing. Of course, we also have the reviews of Chinese, uh, China studies as the second thing, and a, a, a series called Showcasing New Researchers, particularly to in to put together both established academics and young emerging scholars. Now, in this particular AICCS, it's really good to know, uh, notice uh, the emphasis on the Northeast, not only in our thematic panel, but also elsewhere. So um, nothing could have been more appropriate than Prasenjit uh, Duada's uh, 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 special address, keynote address this morning on China and Southeast Asia 
it went much beyond the uh, two, uh, two uh, areas, regions uh, there. In fact, it was a galactic or uh, intergalactic dialogue in itself. And then we have uh, special panels for the uh, young, uh, young researchers. And here also we'll be noted, noting uh, panels that have a connection with uh, the Northeast as a geographical uh, area region at the uh, transbor and its transborder neighborhood. Um, in particular, we have a panel on the geopolitics of transborder water, which uh, is a special panel, but it also relates to our overall theme in very important ways. And finally, we'll uh, later this afternoon, we'll have the special lecture on uh, World War II and uh, by Madhavi, Professor Madhavi Tumpi. And uh, one can be sure that the region that we're dealing with here will come very much into focus in that lecture, as well as, as, well as in other aspects. So it really gladdens my heart that this is the both the Nukal or, or, uh, of our partner institutions and the special theme of this, uh, um, the, this uh, uh, series, uh, 15th uh, of the series of AICCS conferences. And I think it can't be more apt in location, in partnerships and in participation. Personally, I am very happy the Northeast has a particular, uh, I have a particular fondness for that region, all its varieties. I'm just such a beginner and at the same time, quite an enthusiast in learning more. So without more, more ado, we'll go on to the first uh, uh, of the pre present presentations by uh, already introduced for you, for you by Mayongun Min Minal, Minal. <laughs> um, I knew I'd trip up over his name. He's tried to put me right. Uh, my apologies. And um, uh, his, his topic is reinventing the Northeast India Trans Himalaya trading route in the height of Indo China relations, uh, challenges, and prospects. Please go ahead. As you know, 18, uh, 15 minutes. And at the most, 18 will give you a bit of a signal at 15. Thank you so much, Winal. Okay, thank you, ma'am, for the time. So uh, actually my paper, it has been introduced by ma'am well enough. So actually the, the, uh, the paper which I am intend to look is the present day Nordic India, the isolated and the land of Nordic India, it was wrongly documented in the colonial history that it was isolated, it was less civilized. But in fact, the present day Nordic India, it was the trans center for the trans Himalayan border and also it was the channel for transmitting culture civilization. So the present day Nordic India is the trans Himalayan border trade route. And at the same time, it was the trading center for the trans Himalayan region. So why this Nordic Indian region was very much backward after the advent of the British rules and after the Indochina war. And right now, the new geopolitical engagement between China and India. So my paper tried to look into it, how it will be possible to revive the old age glorious past of the Nordic Indias and the Chinas in its linkage and in this relation in the economic engagement. So before I went up, I want to say something in the times of the uh, globalization. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, so many of the academics say that the borders become irrelevant or sooner or later, it will be no more used in the economic discussions and without reference to the respective boundaries, the economic decision we're making. And with the liberalizations and interdependency between the states, the peace and cooperation among the state has been growing. So it encouraged the state to have economic integrations, people to people connections, and to have diversified in economy. So the growing of globalization has made the boundaries relevant. And the natures of borders from barrier, it's become intermediary. But in the context of India and China, 
is going through well. When we look into the context of the EU, it was going well, but in the context of Indochina, it was not like that. Some of the structural realists like Mersheimer, he says that in a great power relations, when a regional hegemons are competing one another, they tend to work together. They work for their own interests and they work for their own benefits. They mostly work on the relative gains where great power emphasis not only on how much they can gain, but also goes on how well it performs in comparison to the opposition. So great powers largely focus on balance of power. It not only considers cooperations with other states if they are in advantage position comparing to their partners. So most of the Western scholars have said that India and China, they are more rivals than partners. At the same time, India and China work to, uh, India and China are more on competitive to become the Asian hegemon, hegemon. So it would be possible in the height of this present days globalizations where India's and China's economy are growing day by day, it will be possible to revive the old age ancient trading routes and to revive the ancient career states of the Northeast region. So before I went up, uh, before I analyze into it, I want to give a brief analyze on how was the ancient Northeast India. So on the colonial documentation, Northeast India region was identified as savage, less penetrated and isolated. But in fact, the Northeast India region was closely associated with the vibrant handicrafts, local products, silk textiles and forests, and it is identified as one of the wealthiest region in India, in the region. So during the range of the Kamrupa, uh, Kamrup uh, dynasty under the Pashkar Varma, he was such kind of ruler that who propagate, who introduced, who diversified the connectivity between the Kamrupa dynasties and the Tibets and the uh, Han dynasties. So he even introduced the Chinese traveler Yun Chan to the Emperor Hashvardhan in order to boost the relation among the Asian kingdom. It was also written in the Islamic uh, documentation that uh, Tabagat in Nasli, it claims that there were 55, five, uh, 55 mountain bars between Kamruba and Tibet. So it was mostly identified in the southwestern track of the uh, Southern Silk Route. Even um, C.A. Bruce, he says that the silver which was used in Assam, it was imported from China. Mahabharata also says that Gamrubas products like silk clothes, everybody were highly appreciated outside the region, which were imported from Yunnan province from China and later exported to other parts of the country through Bay of Bengal via Brahmaputra. It was also found that bamboo was first Bamboo products were first imported from Jiang territory and silk clothes from Shu dynasty, uh, Shu region. So later it was transported to lower Indus countries via land route. And first horses were first brought from Tibet and came out from the west of this region. And later it's exported to different parts of the subcontinent. It has been mentioned that 1,500 horses were sold every day in Karbatan market, which was brought from Tibet. So the Nordic region was such a region that it would become a transit route for the uh, Indian subcontinent. And it was not only a transit route, but it was also a trading hook. It was mentioned that uh, the trade fair in Itakuri and Jamori in Assam, most of the traders from Dawang, from the Tibet, from the Bhutan and from China, they brought rock salt, called dust, ivory, bonnies, uh, Chinese silk, blanket, peppers, and they, um, they bought opium, petal leaf, nuts, rose silk, dried fish, sugar, tea, tobacco, rice from the traders of Assamese, Naga Hills, Mizo Hills, Kasa, uh, Kasi Hills, Garo Hills, Chandia Hills, Kasha Hills, and uh, so many of the ethnic tribes of the Northeast region are engaged in a close relationship with the Tibetans and the Chinese, where the trade fair were held in Utaikuri and Taimori. So, uh, it was found that the western town of Tawang in Arunachal Pradesh has played a significant role in connecting Tibet, Assam, and India. And Tingbu Bus and Bangjen Bus in Tawang near Mohonline served as a key border trade route between the Himalayan kingdoms. 
Uh, it was found that Bangtan Bas, the Himalayan kingdom, uh, has practicing a vibrant trade routes, which provide the bus to Bhutan on the west and depend uh, on the north. Uh, it was found that in Sonazong Monastery in Tibet, there were annual three and uh, three annual trade fairs were held. So in the western Arunachal Pradesh, they were going through uh, Bangtan Bas, and they brought vegetable dyes, greens. Paddy, uh, basket, local millet, pills, purat, and so many local items from the uh, Western Arunachal Pradesh, especially from the Monbar tribes. And they went to the debate areas and they held a uh, three annual field trade, which is June to July, August to September, and December to January. So in return, they brought a large quantities of wood, dry meat, mineral salt, and debit money. And later on, they bought that products and they sent it to the lower Assam areas where they conducted a trade with the ethnic tribes of the Northeast India. So even the dividend also traveled down to Ashing Arunachal Pradesh, extended Pasigat via uh, Kapung La Pass. So it has seen a vibrant trade relations and ethnic linkages between the Northeast Indias and the present day Tibet China. So according to the documentations of the uh, McKenzie, it just says that um, Himalayan Kingdom, the annual trade fairs were conducted at Udaigori, Tamare, and Satya. Uh, the Tibet used to travel from Lhasa with 20 caravans for two months, arriving at market in Juna on the uh, Assam border with wool, rock salt, gold dust, Max horse, and Chinese silks. Um, in exchange from Assam Merchant, they brought uh, chili, rice, and so many local products. Um, they were buying from the Assamese merchant and even from the Nordic ethnic groups, which they have a surplus productions. So it was found that uh, in Taimore and Utarguri, the trade transaction was counted to 200,000 in 1809. It was documented by Hamilton. And it is also uh, mentioned that the traders from Rasa, they bought around 70,000 rupees of gold worlds in the trade fields. So the present day Utaguri and Jaimora is such a vibrant place that most of the trade fields were conducted between the Himalayan kingdoms. And it was uh, during the Hantan SP, the Southwestern Silk Route was established to connect uh, Yunnan, India, and uh, Myanmar. So, Sikh culture was first come from them. At the same time, India has introduced Buddhism through this way also. So, Sikh culture and manufacture were first introduced in Manipur from China. It was documented uh, like that, and it was dispersed over to southern Indus, uh, Indian countries. And during that time, the Sikh culture, where many of the Buddhist monasteries from Tibet, China, they came to India and they used Sikh as a currency at that time in order to stay in the homestay or in monastery, they use, as a, they use Sikh as a currency. And the present day Hoja near uh, uh, Guwahati is also identified as a pilgrimage center. And it was found that the first Buddhist monastery in uh, Tibet, it was built from the mud of Hoja, collected from Hoja. So the present day Nordic India is was also a, generated, transmit ideas, values, cultures, etc. So it is possible to reinvent this space, the trans Himalaya border trade. So we can say that like, yes, we can, no, we can. We can say what, but the thing is, during the British era also, it was badly affected, um, the trans Himalaya border trade. British also trying to introduce the Patkai trading route, but it was not materialized because of the high cost. And at the same time, British is running a steam navigation companies that operate in the river of Burma and likely to be affected if the trade route were constructed. So again, the trading route between the trade connection between the Northeast India and the Himalayan kingdoms were badly affected during the forceful occupation of Tibet by China in 1954 and the occurrence of the Indochina War in 1962. So again, soon after India and China became independent, they tried to reintroduce the old stairway road, which was uh, introduced by the British India. 
So during those times in the 1990s, China began to launch their uh, border opening up policy to develop the border areas and landlocked provinces. So uh, the west southwestern province of Yunnan. In 1999, under BCIM, Bangladesh, India, China, Myanmar, they approved to modernize the old steel road to connect Kolkata, India, uh, Kunming, China, through Mandalay, Temu. So um, under this initiative, China's Western development strategy intends to make Yunnan the trading hook for Southeast Asia and East Asia. And it has undertaken 187 projects worth 3.68 trillion yuan. So at the same time, India is also trying to develop the Northeast India to open up the Northeast region through BCIM and ACTIS policy. So um, under this policy, India has also invested a lot. And at the same time, the government of India has mandatory cross domestic budget for each and develop uh, department, 10% of the funds will be allocated to the Northeast India to develop. So government of India has also initiated a lot to open up the Northeast India border. If this uh, BCIM were implemented and if it is implemented properly, it will transform the Northeast India and at the same time, it will transform the Southwestern province of, uh, Southwestern province of Yunnan. Uh, it will have a greater access to Bay of Bengal, and also the Northeast India can integrate the economy to the mainland India through Chittagong port. It will also gain greater and faster access to overseas market while exporting their products. Right now, goods from Northeast India took one week to reach Kolkata port by road, and another three to four weeks to reach China. But the installation of this project will shorten the distance by less than two days to reach Yunnan and reduce transportation costs by around 30%. So it is well connected that if this tourist pass is reinvented, Northeast India will transform. At the same time, the Yunnan province will transform. It is a win-win solution. But when we look into the strategical perspective view, it is says that India were worried of creating China. China were getting greater influence in the Himalayan kingdom or so. It was pointed out by Pinot Kumar Mishra, director of India Center for Studies in International Relation and Development, he stated that as Yunnan is the most advanced in the cluster, India feared that it will become BCIM economic center with the rest of the region reduced to its periphery. So India was worried about China gaining the greater share of the park. So India was not willing to open up the border or so, according to him. So, um, security threats and strategic concerns also played a huge role where India is opening up the border. S. Simoni, Professor Emeritus, and JNU, and uh, former ambassador has claimed that no economic relation can be one-sided. No economic relation can be intended with security purposes. So India and China has been in the local head for the just, uh, geopolitical rivalry. So India is also worried about China, China's getting, uh, getting greater influence in the uh, border areas. So. Right now, the border issues has border dispute issue has also played a huge role in obstructing and reinventing this trans border trading road. Right now, China has resolved 17 out of its 23 territorial disputes. Right now, um, it has a huge dispute with India and Bhutan in the South Asia. But in most of the cases, China has willing to give majority of giving the greater share to the disputed areas where they have claimed the disputes. But it was not a good same to India. India has also given a greater share to Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. I'm sorry when to interrupt, they... you have two minutes left. Okay, sure, sir. So it have, uh, it, China has also never accommodated India's interests and also India, accommodated, uh, India never accommodated China's interests. And at the same time, China has also huge irritation between the India's hosting of Dalai Lama in Dharamshala. So China was claiming that India was hosting separatist leaders and they were trying to bring a turmoil in debate areas. At the same time, in recourse to that one, China is also supporting the Northeast insurgency movement. So right now, if the trading routes were open, it will give a greater access to Tibetan XR government in Dharamshala to influence in the debate for their autonomy and for the separate. Um, the bad region. And at the same time, 
It will give an upper hand to the notice insurgency which is going on. It will give an upper hand to the notice insurgency movement to have a closer contact with China if this trading route were open. So right now, India is also worried about the uh, overflowing of cheap Chinese goods in the Nordic market, and at the same time, it will all flow to, to the other parts of the Indian cities. So right now, India is also worried about in terms of strategic, strategic perspective view, in terms of uh, economy also. At the same time, China also never accorded, never recognized the state of Arunachal Pradesh, and they even uh, stopped in, uh, international financial institution and third world countries to invest in Arunachal, citing uh, uh, dispute areas. So right now, the Nordic India has become a, uh, Become, uh, it's it's become the hotbed for India and China engagement. At the same time, most of the development in the border areas also obstructed by the Indian military, citing that it will be huge plunder for the Indian security perspective view. If there is no road connectivity, China can easily uh, uh, advance their confrontation to India. So right now, uh, the North East India become the victim of Indo-China rivalry. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Um, for for um, Myangam for for that, I think your uh, final sentence actually sums up your perspective. But we're I think we'd be very grateful for your historical perspective on the trade relationships. It's they're not new things that come in with say the BRI or globalization, but actually uh, a historical reality in this part of the world. So thank you very much. Uh, we, you. Now, yeah, we now go to our second speaker, Matthew Tongminal, who's speaking on cultural uh, and trade route linkage between China, Myanmar, and India. Here, Myanmar has come as the mediating term, a study of frontier cross-border tra uh, tribes, Jingbo, Kachin, Singbo, in their various iterations in these three nation states. Uh, some of this will overlap with what you've just heard or rather reinforce it. So thank you very much. Uh, Matthews from the uh, Center for East Asian Studies, JNU. Please go ahead. Uh, first of all, uh, am, am I audible, ma'am? Yes, very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the uh, 15 AICC organizing committee for uh, giving me this opportunity to present the paper. Uh, the title of my paper is Trade, Root, and Cultural Linkage Between China, Myanmar, India, a study of frontier across border tribe, Tsingpo, Katsin, Tsingpo. This paper analyzed the Manao cultural festival celebrated by the Tsingpo, Katsin, Tsingpo tribe in Yunnan province in China. Katsin stayed in Myanmar and Northeast India in Arunachal Pradesh in Assam. And the paper looked into the strategic geographical dynamics inherited by this tribe from ancient trade route during colonial rule and after. Scholars who had, who had studied this region gave different names to the ancient trade routes, such as ancient Southwest Sea Road by Pinyang, Old Southwest Sea Road Network by Gunnar Sidorov and William Ben Sander and uh, Gunnar Sidolov as India-China Corridor. Across the frontier, there has been cross-border connection and interface in terms of social, cultural, and economic linkages that transcend national territories and sovereign control. Connectivity and interaction are part and parcel of human civilization. When these when these are hampered or invaded, exchange of ideas, culture, trade, and people-to-people -people exchange are affected. Great civilizations such as the Chinese civilization, Indian, Iranian, Roman, and all have come in contact or have seared or learned from each other. Uh, for example, we see Buddhism, which originated in the Indian subcontinent, subcontinent uh, spread over to Southeast Asia, South Asia, and East Asia. The Tsingpo, Kachin, Tsingpo, although separated by China, Myanmar, uh, India political border share exact historical origin, culture, lineage, and geographical proximity. Reason states that the Kachin people in Myanmar, the Tsingpo people in China, and Tsingpo people in India share, share the same ethnic origin, origin and live in a similar landscape. As sentence 
uh, Mendy sentence states that these tribes live within, between, and across multiple national boundaries and share long historical roots. So my uh, paper went into four research questions. Uh, did the ancient Southwest Sea Road experience more forcing connectivity as compared to modern times? Was Yunnan strategic location that led to competition among state and non-state actors to gain control over this area in the late 18th and 19th century? Was the creation of modern nation state that led to closure of trade routes and cultural exchange among Tsingpo, Katsin, Tsingpo tribes? Inspire political division among China, Myanmar, India, border areas. Can these three states create a pan cultural exchanges? On the research method, this paper primarily draws upon secondary sources like scholarly journals and books. Historical research methodology has been used for the analysis. Hypothesis. Cultural linkage has a means to re revitalize cross-regional connectivity and cultural space among Singapore, Katsin, Singapore tribe in spite of political division. Now we come on to the ancient trade linkages. From the ancient time, Yunnan acted as a land which, which connect China with Southeast Asia and South Asia. Uh, we see that road network uh, function as early as the second century BC. Through the Southwest Sea Road, trade and commerce uh, flows, such as uh, the flow of uh, uh, trade, such as I, uh, in terms of exchange in ivory, soul, tea, horse, jet, gold, copper, elephant cotton, opium, tin, lead, and silk. Exchange in terms of religious ideas such as Buddhism, Taoism, and Islam also occur. Indian influence on Yunnan can be seen in uh, two practices, uh, such as Buddhism and uh, the use of kauri money. From the fourth century onward, the Buddhist pilgrim took the Southwest Sea Road to India. Southwest Sea Road, is one of the route which Buddhism came, came to uh, the region and China uh, beside the Northern Sea Road. Moreover, uh, they, uh, during this, uh, from uh, the sec uh, second century, uh, second century uh, to the sixth century, we see more than uh, 227 uh, Buddhist monks have traveled. Uh, there was exchange between Ch uh, Ch Chinese monks and Indian monks. More than 227 passes through this Southwest Sea Road. As Mandy uh, Sandy states that, Long historical status of this, uh, this area is a land-based uh, communication between India and China. So from uh, uh, the Chinese Empire, also from the Han Dynasty to Qing Dynasty, we see that uh, the Chinese uh, Empire, so Yunnan as a strategic, uh, because of its strategic location and the trading network it provides and the natural resources that it provides, the Chinese uh, Empire uh, has put more emphasis on uh, ways to control or to have an upper control in this area. So, yes. so we come to the col uh, colonial uh, period. From the 19th century, uh, we saw the inter in, uh, interplay of different actors uh, uh, within and outside uh, this area. Uh, we see the colonial power expansion, uh, especially the British and the French uh, uh, trying to gain control over uh, this area when the, uh, the British uh, control Burma, we see uh, the more expansion into uh, uh, China, uh, Yunnan province area. And even the France also control, uh, the France, when it began to control uh, Indo China, there were lots of contests among uh, this uh, the colonial power to control this strategic area. And both within China also, we see during the late Ming and the Qing, uh, Qing dynasty also, we see uh, uh, the Qing empire trying to gain uh, control uh, into Yunnan and uh, broader Southeast Asia. And uh, uh, this policy, they make it as a, a state project to control this area. So uh, areas inhibited by this uh, Qingpo, Katsin Qingpo was uh, during the 19th century, it was no longer localized uh, uh, because uh, global or regional disruption uh, or incidents could have implication for this area. Uh, we see the problems such as the Taiping Revolt of 1850, the Panthe Revolt of 1856, or the Singapore Revolt in 1843, uh, all affected the trading routes uh, during uh, uh, the 19th century. So uh, we see that other players such as the local Singapore elites in the Patkai region and the 
think how I lead to the east, control the exit and entry point during this period. And uh, the trading routes has been also affected by uh, bandits and robbery. Uh, rob uh, robberies. Among this uh, reward, uh, we see that the Panthe reward caused a major disruption in trade and commerce during this period. So Yunnan province, uh, Yunnan uh, province during the uh, Yunnan uh, strategic location uh, during the 19th century can be seen uh, uh, has gained much importance during the 19th century, especially uh, during the uh, uh, first half of the 20th century when the Second World War uh, took place. Uh, Yunnan acted as a defense line, if, as a defense. Uh, line uh, for uh, for the British uh, to use the reason as a defense lines against the Japanese expansion in, into uh, India. American wanted to use as an alternative route to connect with mainland China and support Chinese government. So during this period, we saw uh, Burma route uh, gaining importance uh, as a supply route and uh, defense against Japanese ex uh, expansion. The, uh, the Burmese road was uh, completed in 1939, uh, linking Kunming in Yunnan with uh, last year in uh, Burma. Uh, then uh, from uh, the Northeast India, we, see, uh, we saw uh, the Ledo Road or the, or the Sitwell Road was also completed in 1945. That connect with Burma Road and uh, that link Northeast India with Kunming in Yunnan via the Katsin region. So the, north, uh, the Katsin region uh, in Burma, especially the Northern Katsin state, gained important because it provides uh, a direct link between China and India by land and sea. Uh, Mandy uh, Sandy states that the Kachin region become a half of major air strategy, part of uh, the hum, which breeds the extended eastern Himalayas and Yunnan. So during this uh, Second World War, we see that uh, Midkia, the capital of uh, the Kachin state, was uh, during the Second World. It was one of the busiest uh, air base in the world when it became a base for supporting allied force in China, Burma, India. The uh, airline started from Assam, passed through the valley of Himalaya, and then in uh, Hingtun Mountain, and landed in Yunnan province. So we see that uh, uh, the Southwest Sea Road, or the, this, uh, what, what I call the Tsingpo, Katsin, Tsingpo areas, has been from uh, ancient uh, to the 19th century. So we see uh, the importance of this reason. And during the uh, uh, ancient time, when the northern uh, sea road uh, was uh, disrupted, uh, the southwest sea road has been a line of communication, a line of trade, uh, as an alternative or as a backdoor for the Chinese Empire. So, coming to the post colonial uh, period, uh, with the creation of a modern nation state after the late 1940s, uh, we saw uh, the independence of. Uh, China, Myanmar, and India, we see state uh, uh, because of uh, its internal problem in China and Myanmar and India, and the newly uh, created nation state was faced with lots of internal problems. We see uh, the Southwest Sea Road begin to lose its importance and uh, the, uh, the legacy of colonial uh, uh, problems such as border conflict, border tension, and border uh, pro improperly demarcated, all this uh, created a, uh, a problem uh, across uh, this tree tribe and there has been no concrete uh, or uh, proper channel of communication within these three countries. So from the late 1940s, we saw uh, corridor mobility begin to fade a state barrier, state created barrier in their border areas. So. <clears throat> So the, uh, Manau, the Manau Cultural Festival, uh, which has been celebrated by uh, the Tsingpo Katsin people across the three countries. Uh, although there might be uh, details uh, uh, during the olden days, it was mainly celebrated by the Tsingpo in Katsin state, but uh, due to, uh, especially after uh, the creation of uh, these three countries, which, uh, and especially after 1994, uh, when Katsin, uh, Kachin Independent Army when they uh, signed a ceasefire. There has been lots, lots of uh, relaxation on the part of these uh, communities to more of uh, the uh, I mean, a secular nature of uh, the Manao. So 
we see that uh, this Manao Cultural Festival has been celebrated in China, Myanmar, and uh, India as well. So uh, Manao uh, as a cultural festival can act as a cross-regional connectivity or part a pan-cultural celebration. And through this, we, we, uh, we can have, uh, uh, these three states can have a cultural exchange between them, or uh, the state can create a cultural space or social space among these tribes. In uh, conclusion, uh, the, there has been a lot of research and work done on trade linkages between Yunnan and Southeast Asia, Indian subcontinent. The paper seek to understand the dynamics of this region, that is uh, China, Myanmar, uh, India, inhabited by the Tsinghua, Katsin, Tsinghua tribe, by looking at from ancient time, the colonial period and post-colonial. Although during the ancient time and colonial period, disruption of trade routes like the Taiping or the Banti revolt and non-state actors like the Katsin elite uh, robberies occur, the impact was not as that of the post-colonial period. In, assess in assessing the dynamics of this reason, the post-colonial independence of China, Myanmar, India experienced a shift in border connectivity through the closure of border restriction and control of women along the international border. The reasons are multifaceted uh, and simultaneously are conditioned by state power, as Moller stated. In the case of China, after the founding of the People's Republic of China, China underwent radical ideological movement and inward-looking policies. Myanmar was faced with heading up and military junta control over the, uh, the country. In the case of uh, India, the Norris region was also used by different armed movement because of its porous internationally. All these internal factors, together with the strain and conflicted bilateral uh, relations between China in the, in the international border, conflict of 1962 and unresolved border, has created a strain in the relation. Uh, combining with the, uh, the inter prevailing international uh, politics uh, of the Cold War during uh, this period uh, within the US and USSR. So uh, uh, in finally, it can be said that the Manau uh, uh, festival celebrated in China, Myanmar, India by the Simpo, Katsin, Simpo tribe occupies a great interest in the studies. Culture and cultural festival play an important role in bringing state, society, tribe, and community together. The Manau festival play a significant role in cross-cultural connection between them. It also reconstruct and renovated the Manau as a cross-cultural or pan-cultural festival within China, Myanmar, India. Through this festival, cross-border cultural and trade linkages can be further enhanced when cross-cultural uh, and social space uh, to create uh, a social space uh, should be increased. Thank you. Uh, Professor, you are muted. Okay. Thank you very much to the speaker. And uh, particularly interesting was his uh, was the analysis or bringing into uh, the optics the Manau uh, Festival. We'd love to hear more about that. Now we move on now to the third presentation, uh, somewhat different and perhaps somewhat more uh, theoretical. Uh, that's by uh, Jigmi Yeshin and Lama of the Department of Political Science, University of Calcutta. Uh, as you see the title up there, Disconnections, uh, Residues, that's a, a concept that he'll elaborate, and Tibetan Buddhism in the Eastern Himalayas. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. I hope I'm audible. I uh, guess, yes. Okay, thank you. It's uh, truly an honor for me to uh, present uh, in the um, AI uh, CCS. And it's after, I guess, seven years that I'm presenting again. Uh, the last being uh, I'd attended the one which was held in the Banaras Hindu University. So I would like to thank the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity. Well, uh, uh, the title, as you have already mentioned, and also it's already there on the screen, uh, my presentation starts uh, through uh, uh, invoking the narrative of the semi-historical figure, 
known as Guru Padma Sambhava, who is popularly known as Guru Rinpoche by adherents of Tibetan Buddhism. Now, according to his biography, the Pema Kathang, the Indian master was supposedly born in Odian, which corresponds to the Swat Valley in uh, modern day uh, Pakistan. However, there are other narratives which emphasizes on the idea that he was born in uh, modern day Orissa. He is accepted as a patron deity by numerous Himalayan communities in Sikkim and Bhutan, with the Sikkimese according him the status of a patron saint and his birthday officially commemorated as uh, Thungar Sechu. Uh, interestingly, Guru Pema Sambhava had received much of his uh, tantric skills while traveling through different parts of the uh, Himalayas. Uh, where there are numerous sacred spaces associated with the Indian master dotting the landscape all the way from Ladakh to Arunachal Pradesh as well as inside Tibet. Now turned into sites of pilgrimage, these were the places where the Indian master had shaped his uh, tantric prowess. They carry his imprint in the form of monuments, relics and folklore associated with his spiritual and religious activities. The various markers display a rich diversity, whether in terms of the legends and the mythology associated with him or the architectural uh, and monumental relics that are still used to pay homage to him. This demonstrates the ability of the Indian Tantric saint to contextualize and localize his message, taking into account the particularities of place and the sensibilities of the people. While striving to spread the core tenets of Buddhism, he molded his teachings in the local idiom and culture, making assimilation of the faith much easier. The plurality of Pema Sambhava is also reflected in the multiple forms taken by him, which includes the more famous eight manifestations or the Guru Tsenke. The multiple forms can be understood as the Tantric master's adoption of local ideas and norms, making them a larger part of the Tibetan Buddhist cosmology. One can actually create a hypothesis that Tibetan Buddhism, as we know today, received its formative values and norms in the Himalayas before taking roots in Tibet, in which Pema Sambhava has played a highly important role. In a way, the agency of Padma Sambhava is... Uh, is an example of the multi-layered connections that make up the Himalayas. His activities cut across the high mountains and valleys of the Himalayan range. From the caves of Halishi Maratika in Nepal to the Khandrasangpo in Sikkim, he meditated and gained numerous tantric empowerments. Now, tantric practices carried forward by the Indian saint and others after him in Tibet and the Himalayas integrated within the social fabric of the region. The emphasis uh, on non-binary, archaic, non-institutional frameworks is seen to be creating an affinity with the local religious systems in the Himalayas. Turned into protectors or the Sumas by Pema Sambhava and other Buddhist figures, the local deities were uh, propitiated by the communities in the Himalayas. For instance, in the case of the 12 Tema goddesses who were bound by the Guru in the Asura Caves in Parping, which you see uh, on the screen, uh, they are venerated by all Tibetan Buddhists. While the interaction between Buddhism and the Himalayan communities is marked with notions of gaining consensus and, look, and uh, creating compromises, there is also the presence of conflict and contestations with narratives of local deities escaping and thus resisting the process of binding by the Tibetan Buddhist masters. Tibetan Buddhism is seen to be the common thread connecting the Himalayas. The Buddhist interaction with several religious systems in the region created a syncretic process reflected in the establishment of spaces venerated by Buddhists and other communities. In the picture uh, with goddess uh, Kali, you have Tibetan Buddhist protectors. This picture is from the Mahakal temple in uh, the hill station of Darjeeling. Significantly, Tibetan uh, Buddhism also evolved into a source of sovereignty and legitimacy for numerous ruling elites in the region the genesis of which can be traced to the 14th century alliance between Kublai Khan and the Sakya Lamas of Tibet. The Mongol Yuan dynasty gave the Sakya Pass the authority to govern over the Tibetan regions. However, Tibetans generally portray the Yarlung dynasty emperors of the 7th and the 8th centuries as Buddhist rulers or Dharma Rajas, which however needs to be contested as Buddhism was simply one among the many ideologies in the Tibetan court. Finally, it was in the 1600s that Buddhism emerged as a hegemonic political ideology with the establishment of the Gilukpa, the Yellow Heart School led by the Kandipodrang government in Tibet. The state was headed by the reincarnated fifth Dalai Lama, who wielded spiritual and temporal powers. Uh, in the picture, uh, you see the fifth Dalai Lama with the Qing Emperor. And as what Professor Dwara was mentioning, they are somewhat on an equal status. This unique sta uh, state remained in power till the 20th century and was disrupted with the Chinese takeover of Tibet in the 1950s. However, as discussed in my paper, the ritual sovereignties exercised by the Tibetan Buddhist state continues to exist and interact with the modern polities. Tibetan Buddhism as a principle 
principle of sovereignty was seen in the establishment of the state of Bhutan. The Dragon Kingdom was unified in 1625 and ruled by a monk named Shabdung Awang Namkil, who had sought refuge among his followers in Western Bhutan after a political opponents in Tibet challenged his reincarnate status. In 1625, the Shabdung proclaimed the formation of a new state which was based on the Chusi principle, which means an amalgamation between religion and politics. Around the same period, the Buddhist kingdom of Sikkim was also established in 1642 with the fo foundation of the Namgil dynasty as sovereign rulers of the eastern Himalayan state. The first ruler of Sikkim was Chogel, uh, uh, Chogel Prince of Namgil, a layman who was enthroned by three Buddhist kings who arrived, uh, sorry, three Buddhist monks who arrived from Tibet, which you see in the picture, the cover of the book by Sol Mulad. The subsequent rulers were all secular individuals, except for the case of the eighth Chogel Sikyong uh, Namgil Tuku, who was recognized as the reincarnation of his paternal uncle, the head of the Podong Monastery. Recognizing a member of the ruling dynasty as a Buddhist reincarnate can be understood in terms of the legitimacy and authority enjoyed by Tibetan Buddhism. The Chogil's rule directly adhered to a Buddhist ideology, which also included the process of co-option and incorporation that the 8th century Guru Padma Sambhava had brought into the Himalayas. Uh, the first Sikkimese monarch legitimized his rule through the signing of the Lhoman Tsongsum Treaty. The treaty was signed between the Tibetan origin Bhutias, the Lepchas, and the Limbus in the aftermath of a conflict. Interestingly, these communities are organized in diverse polities. The Limbus hailing from eastern Nepal were, uh, were uh, organized in the form of a confederacy who paid tribute to Sikkim. Interestingly, the Lhoman Tsongsum Treaty invokes uh, the Tibetan Buddhist deities as well as a protected deities and patrons of the religions of the Limbus and the Lepchas. Saul Mulad writes how the emerging Buddhist kingdom in Sikkim incorporated the non-Buddhist and local deities such as the Kanjanzonga or the Kanjanzonga. Uh, the inclusion of these local gods shows a high degree of cultural awareness on the part of the Sikkimese kingdom in as much as it recognized the religious differences in the region. The inclusion of the different religious traditions in the area also reveals the diversity in the kingdom of Sikkim and the adjoining Darjeeling Hills. <laughs> Uh, syncretism was deployed somewhat by the Sikkimese ruling elite to generate legitimacy. Hence, the Himalayas had unique forms of sovereignties, many of which drew their legitimacy from Tibetan Buddhism. We see the presence of different forms of polities which adheres closer to a trans-ethnic empires or continental polities and an absence of a unified sovereignty, which is the core value of the nation state. The Himalayan kingdoms actually reflect the idea posed by Susan Rudolph, where suzerainty or minimal control was extended by a dominant power. In these regions, one can see the presence of self-regulating groups, which had certain links to the center through giving tributes or through a weakly specified ritual sovereignty. The ritual sovereignty was derived through Buddhist values, whereby a number of Himalayan kingdoms not only saw Lhasa as their cultural center, but also emulated certain practices followed by the ruling elites in the Tibetan capital. Through the Buddhist cosmological world in the Himalayan region, Lhasa and the Tibetan reincarnates used to exercise a form of ritual sovereignty in the region. This symbolic sovereignty is a phenomenon which was much prevalent before the advent of the nation state in the region. Another way of comprehending the sovereignties exercised by the Tibetan Buddhists and Tibetan Buddhism in the Himalayas is through the idea of a mandala, the organization of a kingdom corresponding to a galactic polity. Derived from the writings of the anthropologist Sanne Tambia and Clifford Goetz, the mandala form of statehood was defined by its center rather than by its boundaries, and it was composed of numerous other tributary polities without administrative integration. There is the presence of an exemplary center with sovereignties in the Himalayas claimed through multiple and shifting articulations positioned in a complex geography of graded and partially overlapping shades of political and cultural authority. The exemplary state can be in the form of a monastery or a even a presiding deity or an individual, the latter being a reincarnate, such as in the, in the individual of the Dalai Lamas. Through exercising traditional charismatic legitimacy, these figureheads assume the position of the exemplary center. However, the creation of the center in the mandala is a process that involves the deployment and the invoking of rites and rituals, such as the Kala Chakra Tantric ritual. The dawn of the nation state in the Himalayas led to a disruption of these ritual sovereignties. With the Chinese takeover of Tibet, the age-old Buddhist theocracy in Tibet came to an end. Although from 1951 to 59, what is interesting is how the CCP attempted at creating a united front with the traditional uh, ruling elites in the Tibetan areas. This process can be understood as the interaction of traditional sovereignty in the Himalayas and the modern state systems, which has led to an incorporation of the traditional elites. 
However, by the late 1950s, especially 1958 onwards, this formula of power negotiations between the modern communist state of China and the Tibetan traditional elites started developing cracks, which culminated in the failed uprising by Tibetans in 1959 that subsequently led to the flight of the Dalai Lama into exile in India. Now, a reason that can be cited for the uprisings by the Tibetans is the failure of the modern state in comprehending the traditional ritualistic sovereignties, which is seen to be a norm in the inner Asian highlands, as well as in the Indo-Himalayan borderlands. Remnants of the traditional sovereignty forms are still seen to be much prevalent in these regions, especially in the context of the Himalayas. Now, another manner or a way of understanding the interaction between the modern nation state and the traditional sovereignty forms is through the lens of the residual as propounded by the Marxist historian Raymond Williams. The idea of the residual for him is that it is an element which is formed in the past, but which is still active in the present cultural process, not only and often not at all as an element of the past, but as an effective element of the present. Furthermore, the residue in most cases has to be incorporated if the effective dominant culture is to make sense in certain areas. Hence, if the modern nation state can be seen as the dominant cultural matrix, the residual can be seen in the context of Tibetan Buddhism and its influence in the modern state of India and China. The case of Tawang and the a continuing Sino-Indian conflict over the region is a good example of how the residual actually functions. Mm. In this context, the Chinese claims over Tawang stem from the historical connections that the region had with Tibet. In the late 1980s, China employed the Tibetan residue in Tawang through publishing a series of articles compiled by former Tibetan aristocrats and Lhasa government officials who had linkages with the region. The volume was compiled by the Tibet Autonomous Region's branch of the CPPCC, an advisory body to the Chinese legislature. Whether it is tax collection records of the Tibetan state from Tawang or the region being the birthplace of the sixth Dalai Lama, the People's Republic of China has attempted to incorporate the residual to bolster their claims over Tawang in the Eastern Himalayas. Now, in conclusion, these residues, which are in the form of the ritual sovereignties in the Himalayas, are, of course, more or less political in nature, and thus the interactions with the emergent nation states are visible. However, the idea of the political in the Himalayas is complicated and is seen to be enmeshed with the social cultural, as it's the case with almost all post-colonial uh, pre-modern uh, states and societies. The role of Tibetan Buddhism, especially the reincarnates and the monasteries in the eastern Himalayas, highlights these complex connections. A major form of ritual sovereignties in the Himalayas is also seen in the form of the monastic linkages, both institutional and the personal, which is seen to be connecting the far reaches of the Himalayas. Majority of the monasteries in the region have the mother monasteries or used to have the mother monasteries inside Tibet. I guess many of them still do uh, maintain a linkage with monasteries in Tibet. Tawang Monastery is affiliated to Dripung, or used to be affiliated to Dripung, which was one of the three great monastic universities in Lhasa. However, after the 1959 revolt and the Tibetans coming into exile, Dripung and the other monasteries have been established in India. Currently, Tawang Monastery and its monks are affiliated to Dripung, which is established in uh, South India. Thus, in the pre-modern period, political linkages in the Himalayas consisted of a web of interrelationships with many ambiguities. For example, many of the smaller kingdoms on Tibet's southern and eastern borders belonged within Lhasa's religious orbit, but at the same time found it convenient to acknowledge the temporal power of the rulers of India and China. Uh, an example of uh, the ambiguity is also seen in the Bhutan-Ladakh historical linkages with both Bhutan as well as Ladakh, both countries earlier in the pre-1950 period having estates inside Tibet, which were all surrounded by uh, this, the uh, sovereign authority of the Dalai Lama. Thus, in conclusion, the dividing line between the political and the religious uh, obligation in the Himalayas is seen to be frequently unclear. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jigme, for that uh, um, very illuminating, uh, albeit quite complex uh, uh, exposition. Um, you know, offered uh, uh, many insights uh, in, in uh, different directions and um, an invoked a theoretical framework with which many of us are familiar through the writings of Raymond Williams to uh, new ends. So thank you very much. I hope you'll get uh, many questions on that. Now, I'd like to uh, call upon our uh, our. Uh, uh, discussant for this time, Professor Shamil Kumar uh, Das, 
Professor of Political Science at the University of Calcutta, previously Vice Chancellor of uh, North Bengal University, um, very, very distinguished uh, participant in this, and we look forward to hearing your views, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Uberoy. Uh, I must begin with a word of thanks to Institute of Chinese Studies and the other collaborating institutions, uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati, and OKD uh, Center. Uh, for keeping me within the time, I prefer to read out a few paragraphs which I have written uh, by way of discussing these three papers. My focus has always been on whatever the three speakers have written uh, by way of uh, preparing the papers. The three papers, to my mind, speak to each other as they try to address the same paradox. On the one hand, as Mayangam says, I will refer to them in their first names. There is the glorious history of close trade and economic relations, cultural and technological exchange, and the trade ideas and innovations travel across societies. I'm indeed reminded of Dunbar's expedition to Tibet, China way back in the late 1920s upstream the Brahmaputra, and he found it impossible to demarcate where India ended and Tibet began. And at one point decided to abandon it on the ground that he might have unknowingly strayed into Tibet and thus exceeded his brief. In 2014, when 20 year old Nido Tanya, a boy from Arunachal Pradesh was killed in New Delhi's Lajpat Nagar market in broad daylight, reportedly on the ground that he looked like the Chinese and had had a Chinese haircut, I thought China is no longer confined to the bordering Northeast, but has moved into the heart of India, sparking the kind of reaction it did. On the other hand, these relations were, as Mayungam says, quote, closed down, or as Matthew puts it, came under closure thanks to the rapid securitization or militarization as Jigme argues. I will ask Mayongam if the British enforce the closure by mistake because they did not have any knowledge of the cultural continuities and relations as Mayongam would have us believe, or they did it as a means of laying down a colonial state structure in the region. One should not forget that colonial ethnography in the region, particularly since the late 19th century, developed as an ancillary to colonial administration. In fact, most of their administrators were great anthropologists or not so great ethnographers. The three speakers provide three different answers to the paradox. Mayungam argues that the closer trade and economic relations, cultural and technological exchanges cannot be sustained. As he concludes, quote, for India and China opening the frontier border for greater regional economic integration is not likely to happen in the coming years, unquote. Like the old fashioned anthropological writings, he seems to have stuck to the tradition modernity dichotomy a dichotomy between the glorious history and perhaps the not so glorious history of the modern nation states. Matthew shows how the closeness and continuities were broken into fragments, pieces, configured by and within the nation states. How the festival, Manau, takes different forms amongst the Jingpos of Yunnan, Singpos of Arunachal Pradesh and Assam, Kachins of Myanmar. None of these forms is unproblematic for each constitutes a contesting site of appropriation by the atheists in China, Buddhists in Arunachal Pradesh and Assam, and Christians in Burma, Myanmar, undermining in the process what he calls the broad and secular nature of the festival. So within each nation, the festival gets configured uh, in response to the cultural context. A reference to the fluctuating outcomes of the contest could have made the paper more interesting. 
each fragment derives its synergy from the respective nation states within which it functions. I have a feeling, but I'm not sure, that it takes the process of subsumption of the festival within the nation states as given. Uh, in other words, you know that the festival has to operate within the given cultural context. It doesn't have, a, have, a, or have an autonomy of its own. Ritual autonomy, I mean. There is a difference of accent in the two papers. Mayangam believes that given a congenial environment, the nation states may realize and appreciate the value of continuities. And I quote him, the cross-border interaction needs an environment where the nation state shared the same political values, interest, and security. But amongst great powers and regional hegemon ambition, barely work together in an environment of shared interest and values, unquote. On the other hand, Matthew feels that there is still a space left for the people to play a critical role in persuading the nation states to come to realize and appreciate the historical continuities. As he observes, quote, despite all the challenges, relations are built through people to build people contact and cultural and economic ties, which can shape strained relations, unquote. Jigme, however, takes these fragments as remnants or residuals. Lexicon-wise, the pieces that are not subsumed under the nation states, but allude to an older age, earlier age. Although he reminds us that the remnants have a connection with the present. I wish he had space to elaborate on the connection with the present in his paper. The crux of the problem lies in, in his viewing sovereignty as a remnant. If the term sovereignty is viewed as a thing of the past, then the isolated groups living in the remoter regions may be found to be exercising sovereignty much in the same way in which the sentinels in the Nicobar Islands have been exercising sovereignty for the last 60,000 years. But much of this exercise has to do with the government of India's policy of non-interference with their affairs. We would like to learn more about how the governments, one after another, have been responding to the remnants of sovereignty. The concept of sovereignty has to do as much with what he does, what it does with, oh, I'm sorry. The concept of sovereignty has to do as much with what one does with it as how one meets with the challenges of contentious sovereignty claims. The role, of the, the role the governments play in deciding the questions of, let's say, monastic succession, inter-monastic rivalries, construction of dams in the sacred place of Zongu, in the catchment of the Tista, in subjecting the treasuries of the monasteries to regular financial audit, court cases, etc., could have been interesting sites of study. Sovereign claim making, unlike other varieties of claim making in politics, has one distinctive feature. Making the claim to sovereignty is as good as exercising sovereignty. For the moment one makes the claim, presumably before an authority, I'm sorry, for the moment one makes the claim, presumably before an authority, one submits to it, thereby compromising, if not undermining, its sovereign status. There is no superior authority to settle the contending claims of sovereignty. There cannot be any. I once described them as parastates. The parastates are known to have their own armies, impose ban on showing of Hindi movies, impose dress code on women, issue driving licenses, and so forth. I would like to know if in any of these cases we have the examples of remnants arrogating to themselves a military power and the power of collecting taxes, I'm not meaning donations, and I make a distinction between taxes and donations. As Charles Tilly says, while summing up the experience of state making in Europe, the two prerequisites of sovereignty, military power and tax collection. We have the experience of predominantly Buddhist Kachins across the border doing the same about whom much has already been said. In this connection, one has also to ponder if such terms as sovereignty, suzerainty, self-regulation, minimal sovereignty, symbolic sovereignty, ritual sovereignty, etc., each 
has been deployed by Jigme could be deployed as synonyms. I am reminded of Ernst Cassider's old work on symbolic forms in which he would have defined symbols not merely as superficial or cosmetic, but real insofar as they triggered practices of translating the symbols into reality. In both Mayung, Mayung, Mayungam and Matthew, colonial and nation states on the one hand and groups of people inhabiting the Tibet, Burma, Myanmar, India continuum on the other hand, are seen as pure entities competing with each other for establishing their respective authorities over the area. It would have been interesting to see how the interactions between them have been impinging on each other and thus help re-articulate re each of them in the process. In other words, the nation state doesn't exist in its pure form thanks to the interactions. And the people don't exist in their pure form thanks to the interactions. So it's the interpenetrating nature that I'm referring to. So neither the state nor nation remains cast in the classical mold. One has to understand that it is no longer a zero sum game between them. The interactions produce an excess that the nation states, for instance, are unable to appropriate. I will end my comments by citing from one of my ethnographic works. I met Bhim Bahadur Tamang in Gangtok in 2018, a diminutive man of 61 years. He has been serving as the postman for more than 25 years, an increasingly thankless job in a world of digital communication. But for three minutes every Thursday morning, Tamang becomes the living bridge between India and China as it trudges through the meters of snow at 14,000 feet to deliver mail across the mountainous border pass of Nathula in Sikkim. As Indian and Chinese troops and their artillery are stationed eyeball to eyeball outside, inside the shed, mail bags are exchanged between Tamang and his Chinese counterpart without a word being spoken. Quote, it's a very short process, Tamang tells me. We just exchange bags, sign the mail manifest and leave the shed. There is no conversation whatsoever. I speak Nepali and Hindi. My Chinese friend follows none, neither, unquote. He addresses his Chinese counterpart as friend. The silent friendship continues when the two armies wait outside, expecting an act of war from one another. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much to uh, Professor Das for that uh, really uh, inspiring uh, summary of the three papers interrelating of them all. And the final uh, ethnographic fragment from his uh, own experience of the postman in uh, Nasrullah Pass in Sikkim. Um, this is, um, he's raised many important questions uh, that concern the three speakers. I think we, um, uh, we could refer back to the speakers if they would like to come in on any of the questions raised by the discussants before we throw it uh, open. We haven't much time uh, to the uh, uh, to, uh, wider questions, of which I can see only one at the moment in the chat box. Nishant can put me right perhaps later. So uh, let us return now to... Uh, to uh, 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 Mayangam, uh, did you want to come back on any of the points that uh, Professor Das has made? Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I'm Odiba. Yes, you are. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, what I mean to say is there is a huge resentment from the border areas to continue the trans ethnic engagement. But the thing is, because of the established authority in the debate areas, now China has put up a strict security that no one was allowed to pass without a, a government authority pass. So, and in the Arunachal border areas, it's become highly militarized. And from the peoples of Majuka 
before they continue to visit the areas in uh, Lhasa areas. Now it's bad, it has been banned. So there's a huge resentment from the people, those who are residing in the border areas. They want to continue the trans ethnic engagement, but because of the established authority, bearing up security uh, reasons, such kind of things were spared. Thank you. Right. Would anyone else like to come in on that particular point and it's uh, uh, how, the interpretation of that particular point? If not, then we uh, uh, go to Matthew and uh, ask if he would like to uh, particularly uh, re uh, respond to the several points made by Professor Das with reference to his uh, presentation and in general to the nation, nation uh, to the uh, the concept of uh, uh, the fragment or the residue uh, uh, as enunciated by Williams. Matthew, would you like to come in? Uh, Ma'am, I first of all I would like to uh, thank Professor Das for his, you know, uh, his comment. Uh, I should say I have no, uh, you know, comment on uh, his take on this. Okay. Uh, then uh, to Jigme, if we'd like to go on to Jigme, would you like to respond at all? Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. And it's really. Uh, Great pleasure to have Professor Das as my discussant, who's also my senior colleague uh, in the department. So uh, absolutely wonderful the ideas that he has uh, given, uh, the points that he raised, and I'm sure to incorporate much of these points and work on this uh, particular paper. Uh, with regard to a few of the points that he has uh, that he has mentioned, uh, for instance, uh, the way through which. Uh, the various states have interacted with the residues. Uh, he brought out that point. And in that context, it reminds me of how, uh, with regard to at least uh, the example of Rumtek Monastery, becomes quite prominent, whereby uh, the Indian state, uh, uh, both the state government as well as the uh, union government, uh, they are seen to be indirectly involved uh, in the succession issue with regard to the Karmapa. Uh, in uh, Rumtek. And right now, as I'm sure everyone knows, and the ones who've actually visited Rumtek, uh, Rumtek is one of the most uh, mm. uh, fortified or militarily fortified uh, monastery in, uh, uh, in India. And uh, over here, this uh, interaction that has taken place between uh, the modern nation state that is India and uh, uh, Rumtek, the monastery, which is, which if, you, if, I, if I use my idea of the residue, uh, is seen to be taking place due to the idea of law and order because of the conflict that, that happened a couple of years back, almost two decades back with regard to the uh, reincarnation of the Kamapa. But however, there are also issues uh, in terms of uh, a lot of uh, shadow boxing and a lot of pulls and push uh, from a number of influential figures within the uh, Indian uh, establishment, the ruling groups who are seen to be involved in... Uh, uh, the present scenario that is there, as we see in the context of uh, Rumtek. So, uh, and with regard to uh, whether they're collecting taxes and all, uh, I don't think so, especially in the context of India. But then, as you've mentioned, uh, with regard to donations, the collection of donations and all, that is happening, but that cannot be uh, taken as uh, taxes, I guess. Uh, also, there's a lot of, uh, in many of these places in Ladakh, as well as Himachal and in Sikkim, uh, monasteries and all, they also have a lot of ownership of land. So uh, in on those lands, uh, there are people who are staying, especially a lot of these uh, agricultural workers and all, they are staying. So they are also somewhat uh, dependent on the uh, monasteries. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, the points that you've mentioned. It's really wonderful. I'll include much of these points. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Jigme, for that. And uh, a reminder that uh, the uh, uh, Professor Dasser's comments uh, come come from a very close and uh, uh, reading of the actual texts of the papers before he put them together in this summary. I think uh, th this will be of great value to the uh, contributors at this point. Now, uh, I have only seen so far uh, one. Uh, 
uh, comment in the in the uh, chat box. This is from Colonel Varendra Sai, uh, who is an old associate of the ICS, and who has experience in the Himalayas uh, from west to east, including a, a spell in his military career in Arunachal. Uh, Colonel, uh, is it possible for Colonel Verma to uh, connect here and ask his question? Nishant, can you help me here or uh, do I yes. need Colonel Verma? Thank you. So with this, uh, we have come to an end of the presentations and the discussion. Now we are ready to invite any comments uh, or questions in the chat box. Uh, the participants can also use the raise hand option uh, if they would like to ask a question or pose a comment. Uh, one of them, as I said, was Colonel Verma, if he's present. Yes. Colonel Sahai, if you're there, uh, we would love to hear your views. Uh, Ma'am, I have one question to Jigme as well, but I cannot post my question there. So I was just a bit confused here. Hello? Yes. You may pose your question. Oh, is that for me? Uh, just a second. I think he has to identify himself, the person who's yeah. speaking. Yeah. Yeah, uh, this is Beam, man. Good oh, afternoon. Beam. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay, oh. Beam. Nice to nice oh, to hear yeah. from you. Uh yeah. actually my camera is not so good. So I was just wondering if I can pose a question straight to Zigmi. Of course. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh Zigmi, uh very interesting presentations and uh, I'm sorry I couldn't hear the other two. But my question to you is with regard to, as you said, Buddhism in Sikkim and Darjeeling, you did discuss about it. But at the same time, if we see the history of Buddhism in, the, in Sikkim and Darjeeling region, we could see it is very elitist in nature. So how do you see or contextualize that in today's context? Because over the you know, period of history, you at least invoked uh, Lomin Chongsum Treaty, uh, also, and uh, whether it is inclusive or exclusive, because many of these monasteries have their own land. And uh, as you say, people do settle in these lands, but however, they don't have any rights there, so to say, of those lands. So at the same time, you have monasteries controlling properties there. So how do you see this? Uh, and, and although it has tried to, uh, you know, bring in or trying, uh, it tried to really uh, co-opt many of little traditions of, uh, you know, in Sikkim, but at the same time, you could also see very exclusive. So what is your assessment on that? Thank you. Uh, do I respond to this, ma'am, or? Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes okay, yes. okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, <clears throat> Professor Subha, for uh, this question. Uh, with regard to Buddhism in Darjeeling and Sikkim being elitist, yes, absolutely. In the context of uh, Sikkim, uh, it was uh, the, Bud uh, the Buddhist monasteries and all, they are seen to be holding immense amount of power and authority. And as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, 1642, when the... Uh, Denjong state was established uh, by uh, the three monks, uh, Hatsun Chimbo and Namka Chimbo and the other. Uh, it was actually established to, in one sense, uh, create a kind of a, uh, a space where Buddhism would actually flourish. So the emphasis was uh, on the idea that Buddhism would dominate. And you have the Chogyals, the line of rulers who are seen to be... Uh, uh, who are seen to be Buddhist and who are also seen to be uh, strongly favoring uh, Buddhism. And I guess one reason why we still have the, uh, uh, the seat, a reserved seat for the Sangha in the uh, Sikkimese assembly is because of the uh, domination and the power being exercised, the influence being exercised by, uh, uh, by Buddhism. And please correct me if I am wrong in this. I guess the present government of Sikkim, uh, the present party who, which came to power and uh, the chief minister, 
uh, Chief Minister uh, Gole ha- got power because of the support that he received from the uh, seat of the Sangha. So in that way, yes, absolutely. It, it's highly elite and plus there's a lot of domination being done by them. And you're absolutely right with regard to the land. But also in the context of Sikkim, uh, Sikkim, Darjeeling to a certain extent and Bhutan, they have their own uh, flavor of Buddhism or they have their own separate understanding or their own separate uh, 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 ideas of Buddhism. Or Tibetan Buddhism is seen to be quite different in the context of uh, Sikkim, where you have a large number of these uh, local reincarnates who are seen to be exercising a great degree of power and authority. And the thing about uh, incorporation of the little traditions is that uh, my point in my paper is that how these in, uh, these little traditions or the so-called little traditions, they are seen to be influencing uh, Tibetan Buddhism from the period of the semi-mythical Padmasambhava. So uh, there is an interaction that is taking place. So in that way, we have the incorporation as well as you have in one sense, the inclusion as well as the exclusion also uh, taking place. For instance, if I give an example, uh, not specifically of Sikkim, but in the context of uh, Mustang in uh, Western Nepal, there are a large number of uh, local deities which were never, which could not be binded or which could not be bound by uh, the Tibetan Buddhist masters. So in that way, all over the Himalayas, from uh, Mustang till uh, the place that we call as Walung, which uh, which is which borders with uh, Sikkim, right? Olangchung, uh, uh, which is very close to uh, Sikkim in uh, uh, <clears throat> in eastern Nepal. You have the institution of the Laban. So the Laban, they are seen to be non-Buddhists, but they coexist with the Buddhists, and they are seen to be. Uh, uh, practicing uh, blood sacrifices. I guess in the context of Sikkim, Anna Baleki Denjongpa has done a wonderful uh, study on this with regard to uh, uh, village Buddhism and shamanism. Uh, I hope I am being able to uh, answer the points, the questions that you have raised. Thank you so much, Professor Subba. Thank you. Uh, well, I think we're almost out of time now. Um, and uh, Colonel... Narendra Sai Verma uh, doesn't seem to be present any longer, perhaps. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm here. Well, then why don't you pose your question very briefly? Yes. With uh, I'll, DRO. Can you hear me? Yes, we can all hear, I'm sure. I refer to Dr. Matthew's presentation that extensive uh, roads are not being built in the border areas because of security restrictions by the defense forces. This situation was in 50s and 60s, but now the Border Roads Organization is building extensive network both in East and West. This has been made possible because our defense forces are uh, quite strong now. Thank you. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, ma'am, can I make a comment on the yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, actually, it was reported in the India Today news channel that it was in the year 2016, the government of India was planning to connect a road from Tawang with Vijayanagar, which is uh, bordering Myanmar. So they were planning to implement, invest around 3,000 crores rupees. 30,000 crores rupees to connect this road. But uh, um, it has been said, the armed security has been said, it will be a security blunder. Uh, it claims that PLA can easily cut off from progressing during the time of inflation if there is no road access. And it was reported that development were uh, pushed back beyond 50 kilometers from the border. It was uh, reported by the India Today News Channel. So uh, I was quoting from their uh, staff. Thank and you. They were Thank you, Mahindu, for your uh, clarification and response. I think we have run out of time now, and uh, it would be a good moment to convey my sincere gratitude on behalf of ICS to all the speakers, the chair, the discussant, uh, for this wonderful uh, discussion that we have, uh, that we have had. Uh, Shortly, we will be starting with another very interesting lecture by one of the veterans uh, in China, of China Studies in India, Professor Madhvi Thampi. It will be starting in around 15 minutes, so I would request all the participants to please stay tuned for that. 
Uh, we'll be taking a short break now, but we'll be back very soon. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.